Good morning. My name is Natasha Oyedeli, and I want to welcome you to the NIH Office of Disease Prevention's Methods Mind the Gap webinar series. This series explores research design, measurement, intervention, data analysis, and other methods of interest to prevention science. Our goal is to engage the prevention research community in thought-provoking discussions to promote the use of the best available methods and to support the development of better methods. Before we begin, I have some housekeeping items. You can submit questions during the webinar by clicking on the question mark in the WebEx toolbar. Please direct your questions to all panelists. We will open the floor to questions that have been submitted via WebEx at the conclusion of today's talk. The slides and video recording will be posted to our website, prevention.nih.gov backslash mind the gap in approximately one week. You will receive an email when they are available. Lastly, we would appreciate your feedback about today's webinar. Upon closing the WebEx meeting, you will be prompted to complete an evaluation. We would appreciate your feedback as it will help us improve this webinar series. Today's speaker is Dr. Katherine Tucker. Dr. Tucker is a professor of nutritional epidemiology and the Department of Biomedical and Nutritional Sciences and the director of the Center of Population Health at the UMass Lowell Zuckerberg College for Health Sciences with an adjunct appointment at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. She received her PhD from Cornell University and her undergraduate degree from the University of Connecticut, both in nutritional sciences. Dr. Tucker has contributed more than contributed to more than 400 articles in scientific journals. Her research focuses on dietary intake and risk of chronic disease, including osteoporosis, cognitive decline, obesity, metabolic syndrome, and heart disease, with an emphasis on health disparities. She is the principal investigator of the Boston Pub Puerto Rican Health Study, an ongoing cohort to examine the roles of diet, health behaviors, stress, genetic predisposition, to relation to chronic conditions, including heart disease, cognitive decline, and bone health. She serves as the scientific advisor for the Jackson Heart Study, a, co a cohort of African-American adults. She's the editor-in-chief of the Advances in Nutrition, the International Journal, International Review Journal for the American Society of Nutrition, and was a co-editor of the 11th edition of the textbook, Modern Nutrition in Health and disease. It is, my it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Katherine Tucker. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here and thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you, Dr. Murray and the organizers of the Mind the Gap series. I'm delighted to be here to talk about dietary assessment methodology um, for assessing risk of chronic disease because it's such an important topic. Way, way long ago, Hippocrates said, if, if we could give every individual the right amount of nourishment and exercise, not too much, not too little and not too much, we would have found the safest way to help. He knew that then and we know that now, but um, we're not in a good state now in, in relation to that. So that makes accessing diet um, extremely important so that we can really understand how our diet is affecting all the chronic disease that we see in this country and that's increasing around the world. So why measure diet? Um, I get this question a lot because in, in studies it's expensive to measure diet. It's complicated. It's not a simple thing like do you smoke or do you not smoke and we need to do it um, and we need to do it well. We need to do it to provide information on dietary patterns that is not possible to obtain any other way. We need to know what the population's eating in order to um, understand that. And in, to inform nutrition policy and guidance um, to the population, we, uh, we need to understand current dietary behavior and just not nutrients, but specific foods and dietary patterns. And the main reason we need to know that is we need to understand how, what the behaviors of diet are, um, the intake of nutrients, foods, and patterns affect chronic disease risk. We know they do. Um, we have plenty of evidence that they do, but we need to understand more the nuances of how 
uh, they do that so that we can inform policy to reduce health risk and improve the food supply. So you all know, I'm sure, that um, we have an epidemic of obesity. This is just 30 years ago in 1990. Um, there was no state that had more than 14% of their population in the obese category. Zoom forward to 2018, and there are many states, in fact, the majority have obesity that's above 30% of the population, and it continues to grow. It's, it's um, very serious and, and one of the most important, if not the most important um, public health problem in the country. Why do we care about obesity? Well, we know it affects chronic disease. So um, diabetes in particular, you can see uh, the, the huge uptake in the percentage of the population with diabetes, um, starting with this huge growth around 19, 1985 and uh, 1990, a steep climb in diabetes. Diabetes, as you know, is a, a very serious illness that, that lasts your lifetime and has many um, terrible complications. So diet related diseases are, are so prevalent and so important. But we struggle a lot with assessing diet and health um, because it's not as simple as say, do you smoke or do you not smoke? Everyone eats. And so it's, it's not a simple relation even with the dietary pattern and the outcome because there's so many interrelating things that are going on. I just put up Rothman's conceptual scheme here to show that um, in the case of chronic diseases, unlike COVID, which is a, a virus, um, there's multiple causes. So you may be eating, you may have plenty of vitamin C, but you're not exercising and so you still have risk or you have low vitamin C, but you have really good in every other respect. So it reduces your chronic disease. You may have a genetic predisposition to certain diseases that mean that you need more of a, a certain nutrient like folate um, than other people. And so there's so much going on that it's not surprising that when we look in nutritional epidemiology at diet and disease outcomes, we tend to see small effects of any specific nutrient or any specific food, um, more so with food uh, patterns, but, but even there, there's so much going on that we are, we really need to work on getting better measurement, not only of diet, but of all the other things and, and how they interact in order to truly understand um, what we should tell people to be eating. So there's a lot of concern because diet is self-reported and um, we're looking at it in cohort studies for the most part. It's difficult to do clinical trials for diet because even if you do them, it's for a single nutrient and that doesn't tell you about the rest. Or even with a dietary pattern um, like the Mediterranean diet, which was done in Spain, a, a wonderful study, but it's a, it's a big operation and there's still a lot of gaps even in the clinical trials. So mostly we tend to look at diet and health in cohort studies. Now we know that cohort studies give us associations and correlation is not causation, but we have methods and if, if you read good work, you'll see that they will discuss Hill's criteria for causality strength of association, consistency of findings, very important, biological plausibility, dose response, time sequence. These are, are age old um, uh, methods of looking at the association you see and, and ensuring that it's unlikely to be by chance and, and strengthening our ability to have faith in those results. And um, we continue to use those. Reproducibility has been challenged in, in nutritional epidemiology and, and it's, it's, it is challenging. It's challenging because we tend to take our studies and put them together into meta-analyses and sometimes the meta-analyses have different results in a, in a bunch of different studies and people say, oh, I don't know what, what to take away from that. The truth is, again, um, it's very, very complicated. You can't just look at a single result like eggs are associated with diabetes, yes, in one study and no in another study. You really need to um, look at what 
the study was. Who, it, who was it? And this is just the hypothetical dose response curve. One major issue is that, um, as Hippocrates noted, um, in nutrition, it's not not just uh, a linear association with more is better, which is a mistake sometimes people use with uh, do with using too many supplements. But we have an optimal range, and if you're measuring in that optimal range, and everybody's there, um, there is no association to be seen. And if they tend to be in the upper range and taking too many supplements or um, eating too much of a specific uh, nutrient that may be damaging in that range, you might see the opposite result. So when you're assessing nutritional epidemiology, you need to look at each study carefully, see where the range is and how the results make sense in relation to their um, level and um, how it affects chronic disease. One of the reasons we have a lot of clinical trials that have been negative um, negative or, or showing no result is because they've been tested on people that aren't low or aren't marginal. And so you're not, not likely to see a result after investing all that in a clinical trial. So it, we have to embrace the complexity, note it, and be very careful about interpretations um, of our studies. So to dietary assessment, how do we do it? Well, there's three main traditional methods, dietary records, 24 hour recalls and food frequency questionnaires. I'm not gonna spend any time on dietary records today because I think um, they pretty much, they've been useful in studies where you have very compliant, well-educated um, participants. But in my own experience where we with the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging, when they started out with a lot of uh, highly educated participants, they got very good records um, from motivated people. By the time um, we were looking at, at these records in, in the 1990s, what we found was that they were incomplete and about half the people were not doing them, so we were losing participants. So we moved to food frequencies there because of that. It's also known that dietary records change people's behavior. If you're writing down what you eat, you tend to eat differently. Um, maybe simplify it or maybe not have that extra piece of cake because you don't want to write it down. So it's actually a good way to diet. So now most studies are using either 24-hour recalls or food frequency questionnaires. They're both very good methods. They both have limitations, and so that needs to be um, considered carefully. 24-hour recalls give you a detailed intake for the previous day, and food frequency questionnaires give us a long-term measure of usual intake using a precept food list. Now, when we're talking about diet and chronic disease, we're almost always wanting to know usual intake or long-term intake. And um, you can get that from a food frequency in a single measure. Uh, to get that from 24-hour recalls, you need multiple measures, um, which is why we tend to see most people in cohort studies using food frequencies. However, um, the, there are a and disadvantages of both. For recalls, the advantage is it doesn't require literacy or highly motivated participants. So an interviewer administered recall can be done with everybody. And it also gives you um, the detail of the foods that they're eating. So it's not limited to a food list. You can get the specific foods, the specific recipes, how the, they're prepared, the specific portion sizes. And so you actually need to have this information um, to build a food frequency to begin with, and that's how most have been built. So this is excellent. This is what they use in the NHANES. Um, and uh, it gives you group means. Um, it can be well done. But the disadvantages are, one, it, it relies on memory. Um, we looked at this in relation to food frequency questionnaires in, in one study of older adults um, and found that the food frequency questionnaires where there's pattern memory actually work better for older adults than what they had to remember uh, eating yesterday. Um, and it's, it can be expensive with repeated measures, um, unless you're using the new automated um, versions online, which not everybody fills out well. 
Um, and most importantly, day-to-day -day variability limits the ability to assess usual intake. So this is an old fashioned dietary intake form. Almost everything is on the web these days, but you ask about your foods and beverages, the, the portion size, um, the, you may gather recipe information, brand name, et cetera. It's always useful to have some kind of portion tools um, in person. I tend to use the NASCO food models a lot because um, they're 3D and they can be helpful, but these 2D food model portion um, booklets, or this is this one in particular is from the USDA, is helpful. You see they have the numbers and they can be linked right into their entry system and it gives people a visual because people tend to underestimate their portion sizes. Um, so it's helpful to have a visual um, to be able to do that more accurately. Now, one of the problems with 24-hour um, recalls has been that they tend to underestimate energy intake and they've been criticized for that. I have to give a lot of credit to the USDA um, and that group uh, for developing this automated multiple pass method where they go through uh, five steps. First, a quick list. Then they go back to probe for forgotten foods. Um, they collect the time and occasion. And then they go back and they get the detail of each food, where it was eaten, whether it was at home or from a restaurant and um, they review intervals between occasions and finally um, provide an opportunity to recall anything else. They've studied this carefully um, against doubly labeled water and shown that this multiple pass method really can help to capture um, the total intakes much, much better than the earlier ways that we collected 24-hour recalls. Most recently, um, we now have a, a wonderful online assessment tool, the ASA 24, that was developed um, at the National Cancer Institute. And they use um, a new approach to asking about foods that is, um, is really great because you can do everything online. They have it organized in a, in a careful way so that it makes sense to the participant. And they've done some, some good research showing that um, people will complete this and you can get good results from this. And the other thing about this is that it's free. Um, so you can set up a study and you get people to complete these and the, the NCI has made it very user friendly. Um, so that's a major advancement. The downside of the ASA 24, again, is that if people are not highly motivated, um, they may not be as careful. And when possible, I um, usually work with interviewer administered questionnaires, but that's often not possible because of cost and cost is high. So this is an amazing cost savings um, when you need to get dietary data um, and it's it's very good, very good tool. But what's the problem with a single day? Well, as you can see here, um, there was classic work done by Beaton in the in the 1980s and early 90s, where um, he did simulations of the effect of multiple days versus one day. And he was working um, with the National Academies, the Institute of Medicine, to try and look at how to improve estimations of intake in the national surveys. And so what you can see here is that when you have a single day, it will um, draw out because there are certain times when people could eat much less than they usually do, but they couldn't do that all the time, or they go to a party and have huge amounts of food and, and they don't do that all the time. So it kind of flattens the normal curve, but the mean is still valid. So if you're going to compare large numbers of people in subgroups of the United States, as they do in the NHANES, that's great. What it doesn't do well is estimate how many people are low or how many people are high. It's going to, you see, it's going to have a much bigger area under the curve. It's going to overestimate the numbers low and high. Importantly, for relation to chronic disease, um, what that the effect of that does is it creates a lot of noise in mitigation so that when you've got a true effect say in this case estimated sodium intake and blood pressure and we know that's related you see this strong 
slope. That's the truth. With one day, it looks almost flat. And that's because the sodium intake um, on any single day could be very different than on a, another day. And the average of those days can be very different. And um, it, it just, uh, the misclassification means you can't see the association. Um, so what this does is it always is in the direction of attenuation as long as the misclassification is random as it is in day-to-day -day variability. We know there's other sources of error that, that you need to think about, but in terms of just day-to-day -day variability, it's completely random. And so when you've got just a few days, you know that you're underestimating the true effect. Now, you can't get back to the actual true effect um, directly, um, but there are ways to do it indirectly. And so one of the ways people have explored and understanding how much our true effect is attenuated is by looking at the intra-individual variance compared to the interperson individual variance, because after all, it's the interpersonal variation that gives us a distribution that can be related to risk of chronic disease. And I'm just gonna show from Ann Hartman that shows that this, whoop, I am so sorry, there you go, um, that this effect varies by nutrient and it varies by foods, not surprisingly. So unfortunately, it does vary in some things that we're pretty interested in. So if, if things are pretty standard like energy um, or calcium, you either drink milk and use dairy or you don't, you can get away with a few days to estimate usual intake pretty well. But if you're interested in vitamin A, um, and some people have estimated even higher variance ratios than this, then you, you really need a lot of days in order to understand um, or capture individual estimated um, mean vitamin A or mean for the individual. And also in foods, you can see that things like um, cereals, people eat them or they don't, um, breakfast cereals are, are pretty Good. And coffee is actually outstanding. It actually has a, a very low variance ratio because people tend to be very regular in the way they eat those. But things that we might be interested in that have a lot of nutrients like liver um, can be completely um, misassessed. Uh, even, even meat and um, berries, something that we're interested in now in relation to cognition, um, will be misassessed even with a few days. So what to do? Well, again, given the, uh, as the assumption that, that this is random, the day-to-day -day variability is random, you can estimate these intra to inter person variability ratios and um, use this equation given the number of replications that you have. If you have two um, recalls or if you have three recalls, you can get a better idea of the true association. So you can demonstrate that, okay, we saw an odds ratio of 1.3, but the true odds ratio may be 1.8. Actually, that takes a different equation, but the true beta coefficient is actually much stronger than what we can show. Um, and we know that there is this variability in there. And that's helpful in our arguments um, in talking about disease associations when people say, oh, you've got is, does it matter? Is that even a significant or, or a meaningful um, association in terms of health? And we can say, well, it's probably a lot stronger than we can measure given all this variability error that we have. It's also unclear how this works um, <clears throat> with complex interactions in diverse populations so that you do this for the whole population and it, it kind of averages things out. And, and you lose some of that uh, variability in doing that. So it's not perfect, but it's very helpful. Okay, so now we'll move to the food frequency questionnaire. And um, it has advantages. It, you can measure usual intake in a single administration. This is why most cohort studies use it, for one of the reasons. 
And as I mentioned earlier, it uses pattern memory, which can be more reliable than episodic memory for some. If you just think about it, you tend to plan your meals for the week. You know what you usually eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and, and how much you have in your fridge. So um, you, you tend to know what you eat, <coughs> and, and it's easier to remember that than, say, all the details of your lunch yesterday, which you may have had with business partners and were talking or whatever. So there are a lot of advantages to the food frequency questionnaire. There are a lot of disadvantages that have been criticized as well. First, it's a defined food list, and um, that food list can't have all the foods or, or people just won't answer it if you have thousands of foods. So what we tend to do is group foods into food subcategories and ask about those. So we may not may not get all the detail um, on the type of green leafy vegetables you eat, but we can put that into a category. The portion size assumptions is where there's limitation in the FFQ. Um, in some, they don't have portion size at all, like the Willet, um, and in others, like the Block, <clears throat> they have small, medium, and large. By only having that information you're necessarily limiting the uh, true variation because we know um, from recalls that some people are quite a bit um, larger in their portion sizes than what might be available. This is another source of underestimation of intake. Another really important area is um, recipes. And this is, this is important because people may um, use different types of fats in their recipes, different types of oil. And um, what we do is we take the average of the majority of the recipes from 24 hour recalls and tend to weight some of those um, in terms of, of that particular recipe, say chili. There may be lots of different ways to make it, but we, we have to limit it in terms of our database. So that will um, underestimate intake for people with unusual eating patterns, like for example, vegans who may be using um, some, um, usually have tofu on it, but there are some of these gluten foods or other things, um, special foods that wouldn't be on that. And people with unique ethnic eating patterns that wouldn't be on the major FFQs. So this is what an FFQ might look like. In this case, there are different ways. In some, some cases, um, you just have the the frequencies, for example, apples, applesauce pears, this is the classic first question on the block. Um, sometimes you have small, medium, large portions defined and at this column for every single food. Sometimes you have the portions as separate questions afterwards. Um, and as I said, sometimes you don't have portions at all. We also, um, sorry, we also often have adjustment questions to kind of calibrate because one of the things we've learned from FFQs is that you can overestimate the amount of, of fruits or vegetables if you give a longer the longer list you give the more likely they add up to more than people actually eat because they think oh yeah I ate an avocado let's see well maybe maybe uh, maybe once a week but actually it's only once a month in their memory, those, those errors occur. So the major food frequencies out there, when people are, are selecting something for, for their study, are the Willet, <clears throat> which um, I have used in the Framingham study very successfully, the Block um, NCI questionnaire that was one of the early ones that um, has small, medium, large portion sizes, and, and it was based on and Haynes data um, based on nutrients of interest for the U.S. population. And the newest one, the, the NCI um, questionnaire that considers the results of cognitive interviews that were conducted um, in, a, in a classic paper by Amy Subar, where she um, undertook understanding how, what people have difficulty with in completing these questionnaires and if there's better ways to organize the questions. Okay, <clears throat> so how do we validate food frequency questionnaires? Well, it's, it's hard to validate 
True validation requires a gold standard, and we have very few gold standards um, other than a few recovery biomarkers, but we call it validity um, when we compare with an independent measure. So the most common validation study would be compared comparing the results from food frequency questionnaires to multiple um, 24 hour recalls because the errors are not highly correlated um, and you can get an idea of how well that does. The other way that we validate food frequency questionnaires increasingly is by comparison with biomarkers, biochemical indicators. Now, one thing that's very important to realize here is that a lot of people when they see the association between food, a nutrient from a food frequency and a biochemical indicator, say, oh, the, the food frequency doesn't measure that well. Um, that may not be true. It may be that the biochemical indicator doesn't measure diet well. And that's something a lot of people tend to forget. They tend to think that the biological mem indicator is truth because it doesn't require memory. However, biomarkers, and how the food that you eat gets into your blood or other, other tissues um, requires um, a lot of uh, complex actions, including homeostasis. If you're, if you're replete, less is going to come in. <clears throat> absorption, if you have any kind of intestinal issues, and now we know the microbiome affects absorption. And metabolism, if you have different genetic um, polymorphisms that upgrade or look downgrade certain pathways, um, you'll have different relationships between your diet and your biochemical indicator. So it doesn't necessarily mean the dietary measure is bad. It's just um, how good is the biomarker. There also can be random lab error. There was a, a lot of concern for a while about vitamin D measurements in different labs. Um, measuring different differently. So there's a lot that can go on <clears throat> with the biomarker as well. Another way that we assess um, validity, kind of face validity, is does the measure of nutrient, food, or dietary pattern correlate as expected with the physiologic response and disease outcome? We know certain are associated um, they've been associated in earlier studies, maybe in clinical trials, um, and they have a strong biological mechanism, such as potassium and, and hypertension. We know that's, that's there. Um, if your instrument is doing well and measuring those things as expected, that's a good sign that your measurement, your instrument is working well with your study. Now, I just want to show some old data from, from Willett's food frequency validation, because when people say food frequencies are not valid, um, that is not true. Uh, it depends on the quality of the food frequency for the specific population and the way that people complete them and, and the compliance. So Willett did one of the first really large um, validation studies. This was pre doubly labeled water. So it was compared to diet records, but he did diet records four times, a whole week, four times throughout the year, um, because what you're measuring with the FFQ is usual long-term intake. So it um, to be valid, that's the best way to do it. And when he did that and compared the food frequency to diet records, Here's the, the current uh, comparisons. You see the correlations are actually very good, given, given the, the variability in diet and, and all its limitations. We've got correlations from 0.5 um, to 0.79 here for individual nutrients. Um, these have been deattenuated using that equation that I, I showed you earlier that's often used in, in validity assessments because otherwise you're comparing food frequencies to diet records or recalls. And the tendency is for people to say, this is a, a validation of the FFQ and the FFQ isn't good. But in fact, if you have only a few recalls or records, it may be that those are what's not good. So it's never gonna be perfect, but the deattenuation method helps to give you a better estimate of the truth. Also, in terms of quantitation, this I found remarkable from Will, um, but he actually got highly motivated individuals, 27 men and women, using his 
116 item food frequency questionnaire to complete a one year diet record. Now this would not work in the general public because most people would not do this, but, but um, comparing a one year diet record with a 116 item food frequency questionnaire from highly motivated and cooperative individuals, it's remarkable that the total energy was so close, the protein, the fat, saturated fat, almost everything was, was in really good shape with the exception of, of vitamin A, which is highly variable. And um, anyway, uh, so that this really to me shows you that if you have the right FFQ for the population and they are highly motivated or you've carefully interviewed or administered it, um, it can be excellent. It can be an excellent tool. The other thing that really convinced me that this can be an excellent tool is that I um, was looking at food frequency data and, uh, and this is the um, Framingham study. And we had plasma measures of folate and homocysteine. And what we're looking at here is total folate intake. And you see this beautiful association with plasma folate and this beautiful association with lower total homocysteine. This is with supplements included, and this is from diet alone. So that that again um, shows you that this FFQ is certainly working or you would not see that beautiful association. Just quickly, another one, this is, this is carotenoids. And again, um, diet, dietary beta carotene um, with beta carotene in the blood, a little bit better for women than men, but it's higher for women than men in terms of the intake. And here's lycopene, full association. So I mentioned cognitive interviewing earlier and um, from Sue Barr, and what she found is that people can have trouble with various aspects of reporting on the FFQ, sorry, um, including the aggregation units, um, number of eggs versus servings of eggs. And um, one thing that's very important is the order of foods. So for example, if you um, ask about orange juice and then you ask about oranges, people can get double count. Um, we see this with rice or rice in, in recipes um, so that we have to be very careful to ask the right things in the right order. So this was the diet history questionnaire that um, NCI developed. They realized from that cognitive interviewing that they really get better responses if they don't use the grid. Um, so this is a long booklet um, where they go question by question. Over the past 12 months, how often did you drink tomato or vegetable juice? And then asking for the portion if they drank it. So this was, this was a new um, scheme that they found helpful and they did a validation study um, comparing it to the Block and Willet. And what you can see here is that for most things, this new format <clears throat> worked well, worked better. Importantly here, I wanna show that Willet's questionnaire tends to uh, correlate more poorly with nutrients for many, many things until you adjust for energy. And when you hear his arguments about the FFQ, um, you will note that he, he always says that it may not, his questionnaire may not measure energy well, and you shouldn't use it for that. But when you adjust for energy, um, assuming that your portion sizes has been kind of uniform across things, then it does perform uh, pretty well. So that's another important issue. And you probably can't see this very well, but this is from um, the newest DHQ3, which is actually a very exciting questionnaire. I like this questionnaire a lot. You can do this online. And it's um, different in that what it has is, is a series of screening things. So do you ever eat fruits? And if you never eat fruits, you never have to go through all those questions and say, no, 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 like you used to do on the grid. Um, so you can select the fruits you've eaten, and then it will ask you questions about only those specific fruits. So it's much more efficient. It has skip patterns, um, and you can get to the details um, much more easily. So this is, this is something um, that I encourage people to take a closer look at. You can see here um, 
you know, go into each of these categories and then go down through and um, answer things more quickly. Just a few more notes on the biomarkers. Um, what do we have? Well, we have direct recovery biomarkers. There's really only a few of those. Doubly labeled water has helped us a lot in um, measuring our dietary assessment and seeing how well we are doing and showing that we do tend to underestimate energy. Um, urinary nitrogen is a good biomarker for protein intake. Um, because you can you can estimate exactly how the protein is is going in and going out, um, but all the other markers are either surrogate markers or integrated markers. And so when we talk about surrogate markers, we also call them concentration markers. And that's those are the things that I was just showing you um, that I've looked a lot at, which are things like folate, carotenoids, vitamin C. These all work very well. Some nutrients don't work as well. For example, calcium in the blood is highly um, homeostatically regulated, so it's not going to uh, correlate very well with your intake. Same with um, vitamin A, it, it correlates well if you're on the low end of the distribution and you're deficient, but once you get above that, um, it, it's also kind of uh, limited. Other kinds of markers are red blood cell fatty acids, adipose, adipose tissue fatty acids. And these markers um, have different meaning that people need to, to understand just as carefully as they do with the diet. For example, serum vitamin C um, turns over very quickly so that um, I've seen people say, oh, well, we did a validation study with um, Four diet records last week and a food frequency, and it measured the the association was stronger with the diet records. Um, that means diet records are better than food frequency. No, uh, it doesn't. It means the diet records are better than food frequency for measuring current vitamin C. But when we're talking about long term usual intake, the FFQ may actually have a more accurate measure. So those are things people need to be careful about. And I've already mentioned this, there's so many reasons that biomarkers are imperfect. Um, there's absorption issues, um, tissue distribution. And we, we worry about um, biomarkers in the blood when we're looking at cognitive decline. Um, ideally, we would get them from spinal fluid, but that's very hard, hard to get. Um, there may be different distributions in the brain than the blood. Um, turnover. Again, as I was just mentioning, there are longer term measures and shorter term measures. It's important to know those. Um, presence of cofactors, excretion, and very important um, effect that people tend to overlook is a powerful effect is medication. So that there are medications, um, a lot of diabetes medications, for example, are B vitamin wasting and, and they're lost in the urine. So they, you may have lower B vitamin levels on metformin um, than you're taking in. And so that, that interferes with the correlation. So you need to think of all of that. And most recently, the microbiome, an exciting new area we're looking at, um, but which has so many more effects um, than we ever knew before. So what do we do with biomarkers? Well, I use them as I've showed you to, to uh, show the associations. I also like to use them um, to relate with my outcome along with diet. And I have several cases where, I, uh, for example, with cognitive decline, well, we looked in the normative aging study with biomarkers of B vitamins and then with the dietary intake and we're able to show very similar correlations. That is another way to validate the dietary intake. When they're both showing you the same thing, you know um, there's a strong association there. But there's some newer statistical methods I don't have time to get into, um, particularly uh, led by, by Ross Prentice's group now, but there's also been calibration studies done by NCI, Victor Kipnis, and other people there. Um, but in, in Prentice's group, what they do is, is they they're thinking about all these issues that may interfere with the biomarker and the actual diet. So they look at it in feeding studies where they know exactly what's going in um, and then looking at the biomarker and creating calibrated equations to adjust for that. And then um, when they we create those calibrated equations, 
along with individual things like BMI, which we know affects um, the biomarkers as well, sex, other things. Um, then they they take that information and they extrapolate to a full sample in their study. Um, and they found that that works well for some biomarkers and not as well for others. Um, the limitation, it's, it's, it's really interesting work. It's, it's great work and it's useful. Um, the important thing in, that is limiting is that you can't take um, the, the equations, say, that, that they've developed from the Women's Health Initiative and apply them to um, the multi-ethnic study, for example. You have to do this kind of work as a subset in each of your major studies. And for major studies, it's worth this. It's expensive and sometimes it's hard to get funded, but it's worth doing these kinds of um, careful calibrations within a, in any large study that's using an FFQ. So just to, just to move forward a little bit, uh, as I'm conscious of the time, one of the, the major problem, a major problem with the, uh, the use of food frequencies in this day and age is we're very interested in health disparities. We need to realize that our country um, in, in 2020, this is, this is data from 2019, is not all middle class uh, white. And that's how a lot of the, uh, they, they, when they were predominant, these questionnaires were developed. That's, um, those are the foods that we see on the food list. We've got a growing Hispanic population, a large African-American population, and a growing Asian population. So FFQs don't capture things well for the majority. And, it, and you can imagine that if you don't have plantains on your questionnaire, which most don't, um, and you are working with Dominican uh, population who eats them every day, you're going to underestimate their calories, fat, carbs, and everything. So this is removing, um, you know, important variation. It tends to underestimate intakes for minority populations, and that's very important when you're when you're looking specifically at that. The food grouping also uh, removes detail on when you're interested in micronutrients. And the assumption of standard recipes also leads to um, limitations in detail. A major thing is standard portions that can lead to bias. Now, it worked very well in the nurses' health study and in the uh, Framingham study, where we were working with mostly middle-class, non-Hispanic white Americans. Um, but when you when you don't have those portion sizes, and here's the uh, the Willett questionnaire and you're looking at other groups, you see here we've got validity coefficients in the WIC study, reasonably good for whites, they're almost non-existent for African-Americans here. And so if you've got a group combined, you've got systematic bias of a poor measurement in these other groups. And here's the block, which did better with the portion sizes, being very important here, but still did not do well with Hispanics. Multi-ethnic cohort in Hawaii, whoop, the same thing. Um, best for whites, they, they actually have, uh, a, I think, an updated questionnaire, which has a good food list, but, but still underestimating in other groups. So we need more inclusive food frequency questionnaires if we're going to keep using them with more multicultural populations. And <clears throat> I'm going to go through this fairly quickly in the interest of time, but what we realized in our Puerto Rican health study is that none of the existing questionnaires would use so would do so um, we created them you always start with 24-hour recalls we had the hispanic canes puerto rican subset and we basically compared them to nhanes 3 and these are a series of foods we added to the questionnaire but more important and a lot of people think about adding the foods but more important than that is look at this is just one example we compared all the portion sizes from the NHANES 3 and the Hispanic Hanes. And this is chicken soup, but you can say the same thing for rice. Um, they eat it as a meal. It, the, the mode for them is greater, much greater than the uh, large serving. We then compared this to a uh, 24-hour recall. And as you can see here, if you use the original block questionnaire, it was underestimating everybody, but it was showing significant difference across Hispanics and non-Hispanic whites. 
um, when we used our revised questionnaire, we were able to get it back. And again, this is just showing that the uh, actual quantities um, were underestimated on the original free, uh, food frequency, and we were able to get them back by adding um, adjusted portions and foods. We did the same thing again, and I'll just go through this quickly in the in the southern part of the United States in the Delta region. The foods people eat are actually quite different than than the uh, majority population. We had collected 24 hour recalls through the USDA in the uh, Delta Nairi study. And we found a lot of foods, things like potato logs, chicken fried steak, grits. Um, dirty rice, okra, chitterlings um, that were going to be completely missed if you use the standard bullet or block. And they noticed this in the Jackson Heart Study when they were getting started because they had used a bullet in Eric and they found it did not work well in the Jackson site. So they contacted me um, to create a, a version of a food frequency questionnaire from the Delta study um, specifically for the Jackson. And one of my um, graduate students, uh, Samira Talagakar, did her PhD validating this. And we found that um, our, our Jackson Heart Study questionnaire did do well comparing uh, to four 24 hour recalls. We had uh, the full long form and the short form, which of course studies want you to do it in 20 minutes. So we had to collapse things. Um, still did pretty well for energy. Um, and macronutrients, but of course you lose detail on micronutrients the more that you collapse it. So getting to the end here, um, the new and important thing and exciting thing is we're moving to personalized nutrition. And if we're gonna move to personalized nutrition, we need to know usual intake, we need to know more detail. So we need to up, up our game on dietary assessment. First thing is, is you need to not skimp on your resources. You need to make sure that you've got the right tools for each population that you're looking at. You need to do sub studies for validation or maybe calibration. And um, now we've got diet gene interactions um, that we are looking at in existing cohorts, but we need to expand those to other populations because we know that there's variation that exists before we move too quickly to generalizations about precision nutrition. So we've got this, this new exciting area. We've got the exposome, the genome, um, we've got the diet, and uh, diet dietary assessments lag behind. We've got better and better methods for the genomics, but we need to up, up our diet as well. Just quickly, this is a diet gene interaction that we looked at in the Puerto Rican health study. And I'll just give this one example. In a low fat environment where they may have been living um, several generations ago, the common genotype um, had low waist, waist circumference in, in APOA 175. But in a high fat environment they're in now, that common genotype actually has higher waist circumference. Than the, than the polymorphism. Same thing for systolic blood pressure. So this is, this is a, a very nice example of how certain populations with, with higher prevalence of some of these polymorphisms tend to have poorer outcomes with the poor diets that they're consuming um, in 2020. So to conclude, what are, we, what are the next steps? What are we gonna do to improve Dietary assessment. Well, we're already doing a lot. I think um, you know the technology to improve measurement by skip patterns so that you can get to more detail without having to go through every single food um, is a, going a long way. I think that you know some people have looked at camera photographs. That's helped a little with portion size, but it hasn't taken on very much um, in the long run. I think there are things like uh, if you can scan barcodes and get more detail on the quality of, of major, major consumed food items, that would be another great thing. Combining estimates methods is always a good idea and it's almost necessary if you're working with a new population that, that hasn't had a standardized FFQ. If you also collect 24-hour recalls, you can, you can 
check the recipes and, and check to make sure all the foods are there and continuing to improve. Food frequency questionnaires can't be static either because diets change. We had to add things like energy bars and energy drinks um, as the, as the uh, food supply changes. There is some statistical modeling that can be done to correct for measurement error. I think it was fantastically applied when we, when we assume random measurement. The bias is more complicated and needs to be looked at um, much more carefully in the face of diversity before it's embraced um, for, for uh, generating to other populations. Um, there's a lot of people still working on biomarkers to get better measures of, of uh, biomarkers that can enhance associations and can be used in conjunction with dietary assessment. Um, we need to get better estimates of dietary quality. We've learned a lot just from general FFQs where we can get dietary patterns and show, and, and we've certainly shown that healthy dietary pattern versus a Western or poor dietary pattern clearly does relate to, to disease, but we need to get more detail within those, I'm sorry, I keep doing it, within those, um, food groups in terms of the dietary quality. If you're eating cheese, is it is it processed cheese or is it um, you know natural cheese? More detail on that. And using more complex data approaches, like people are looking, starting to look at big data, artificial intelligence to combine things like diet with genomics, metabolomics, and, and other things simultaneously. I think that's very exciting. So in conclusion, the chronic diseases are, are just so widespread and causing so much um, uh, health risk and early mortality that, that they cannot be ignored and the role of diet cannot be ignored um, for the health of the nation and the world. And um, we're moving forward, but we need more investment in improving optimal dietary assessment and in combining it with the other measures that we have. Um, to really understand health and disease, not only in the majority, but in diverse populations. So I will end there and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. Um, we only have a couple of minutes before our hour expires, so there's not going to be much time for a Q&A, but let me ask a few. Uh, sure. one, of, one of our participants asks, uh, how often are these FFQs updated? Uh, the food supply and dietary habits change over time. That is correct. And um, it's a tricky thing because if you've already been working in a single study, you don't always want to make changes, but they're not updated that frequently. Um, that's, that's an issue that needs more attention. Um, how do you approach assessment of diet in children? Most of your remarks have been um, addressing dietary intake in adults, but um, yes. uh, kids and adolescents are different, especially small children. Especially small children, and, and I have assessed diet in children. Um, it's much more challenging. <clears throat> there, Harvard did develop a, a kids FFQ. It gives you some information on ranking and dietary patterns, but when we used it, it, to it does the opposite. It totally overestimates diet in kids because kids tend to not eat everything that's on their plate. So for children, I recommend 24-hour um, recalls um, with the mother and the child. In, with young children, with the mother, with um, kind of middle-aged children, with both, and with with adolescents, they and older older teens, they can do it themselves. Thank you. Um, we have a question from someone who uh, uses dietary assessment to measure uh, change as a result of interventions. Mm -hmm. And she, she uh, suggests that 24 hour recalls are probably the best, but does she really have to take three, re three dietary recalls at each uh, measurement occasion? Ideally, yes. Um, you, can, you can use the two. With two, you can look at the inter to inter individual variation and do some corrections. Um, but certainly at least two. You cannot do it with one. You can, I mean, if you have a huge population, you can compare the means, but um, I would not recommend fewer than two. All right. We have, uh, we're going to save all of the questions that have come in um, uh, from our participants, and there are many of them. 
Uh, and uh, we will send those to you, Dr. Tucker, and, and uh, ask your assistance in developing short answers so that we can post them on the website when we post the slide set and the uh, recording of the broadcast. But we've reached the end of the hour, so we'll have to stop at this point. Let me turn things back to Dr. Oyedele. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murray, and thank you to everyone who participated in today's webinar. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we will post slides and a recording of today's session on, to, on the website next week. You will receive an email with a link to the recording when it is available. Thank you.